All right guys, so we're up here at Bribey Island today. They've just opened up the National Park after all this um, COVID-19 lockdown. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you up into the National Park. We're gonna show you around, give you a bit of a talk on what's up here and uh, some of the attractions that we've got here at Bribey Island. So when you're heading up the beach, you wanna make sure you drop your tire pressure to 20 PSI or under 20 PSI, 18 is better. Anything lower if you're in softer conditions. That's so you get a wider footprint and uh, you roll over the sand rather than drop water. Alright, so that's pretty much perfect. Beach, beautiful day out here. It's calm as it's blowing a strong westerly though, southwesterly. So uh, the beach here is usually good when you get a southwesterly, and offshore it's usually horrible. So we're we're a bit lucky. Hopefully the microphone won't make too much wind noise. But here we go, Robby Beach, 22 k's of pristine white sandy beach. This is our first stop. This is Norfolk Lagoon. This is one of four semi-tidal lagoons that we've got here on Bribey Island. Uh, this is the largest lagoon. In total, it's about three kilometers in length. And uh, the color, that's from all the tannin tea trees. It's actually really good for your skin because it's got a natural antiseptic property. Before they locked this down, this was actually flowing open to the, the ocean. So the next stop from here, we're gonna take you up to Mermaid Lagoon. It's another tea tree stained lagoon, a little bit smaller than this one, but really nice up there as well. One where we had a fire back in, I believe it was August of last year, 2019, and it burnt the northern end of the island all the way down to this fire break that's up here it's a little bit hard to see but everything south of the fire break didn't burn everything north basically did uh, it burnt through around about oh, it would have been one third of the national park i believe it's 20 or a little bit more 20 square kilometers roughly that it burnt out So this is one of the types of birds that we get up here. They're called a pied oyster catcher. They're a shorebird and they just feed off of pippies down here on the, um, on the beach line all day long. Quite interesting, quite a pretty bird. Nice orange beaks on them. But this will be a breeding pair. So what happens is when they pair up, they pair up for life. Wow, have a look at this guys. So you got a couple of sea eagles up here. But they've got a fish that they've just dropped. Oh look at that, it's a big toad fish. A big toad fish here that they've dropped. It was alive, it was kicking before. You see it's moving? Alive. I've never seen that before. I never even knew that they ate toadfish. One of the main attractions here at Bribey is all the animals that you get to see. You get seagulls, you get kangaroos, you get wallabies, you get goannas, you get all sorts. You get dolphins, you get whales in whale season. You get turtles as well, if you're lucky enough to see one of them. It definitely is quite the sanctuary for birds and other wildlife. So as you make your way right up to the end of Bribey Island Beach, you'll come across a heap of World War II forts. This is one of them just here. So this one here was an old searchlight. 
And the way that they used it was there was actually a place out at Caloundra that had a lookout. And it'd be looking out to the bay to see if there was any ships that weren't on their log. Now, had they have ever spotted a ship that wasn't on their log, what they would have done was they would have radioed through to a room on the island called the Battery Plotting Room. The Battery Plotting Room would have then tracked and logged the ship and determined whether or not it was hostile. Had they have come across a hostile enemy, they would have radioed through to the two searchlights, the southern one, which is this one here, and the northern one, which I'll show you later on, and the two gun emplacements. They would have then triangulated on the target, lit it up, and then taken a shot. First shot would have always been aimed at the tower, try to knock out command first, and then they would have kept shooting to sink it. But fortunately, we actually never had to do that up here at Privy. This was one of the first lines of defense for the Port of Brisbane. That's where this channel and this ship in the background, that's where they're all going. Behind me here, this is a, another World War II fort. So this one here was the southern gun emplacement. So when this one was in use, it had a six inch cannon on it that they took off of a World War I ship. And it was up there in the middle and it could fire a 46 and a half kilo projectile up to 16 and a half kilometers. Now Caloundra in the distance there, that's approximately uh, four and a half to five kilometers away. So you're looking at three and a bit times that distance and they could shoot you from here if they wanted to. A pretty good shot for back in the day. And if you come further around, got a bit of an information sign here. It's got some information about the duty roster on that back wall, the blackboard. A couple other photos as well. And this room here, this is where they stored the explosives. The explosives that they used up here was called cordite, a really volatile substance. So they had to be careful the way that they used it to make sure that the um, the workings didn't actually explode while they were using it. They got a little breach that they had to pass the cordite through and turn it through and they had to have a blast door shut at all times. So that way, um, if there ever was a spark, it didn't get to the cordite and detonate. This one here, this was the northern gun emplacement. It was a mirror image of the southern gun emplacement, gun one, gun two. And same thing, it could shoot a 46 and a half kilo projectile up to 16 and a half kilometers. There was a total of 150 personnel that served up here at the base. And they served on a 28 day and two roster. So they'd done 28 days solid up here at the base. And then they were given two days off where they generally go for R&R &R over at Caloundra. All right, so these are the mine control huts. You have the northern and the southern mine control hut. And this one here, this one was the detonator switch. And this one here, this one was the generator room. And what they'd done was they ran a cable all the way out, past the shipping channel markers out there in the bay, and they looped it back around. And there was a, another cable in front of that called the guard loop cable. And what would happen was they'd have all the mines anchored down to the sea floor bed, attached to one of the cables, and they'd have the guard loop cable in front of that. The idea was that as the submarine would come through the bay here, it'd go across the guard lip cable, there'd be two big spikes in the magnetic frequency. You could then choose to detonate the mines and blow it up. Now, luckily again, we never actually had to do that. But when they did pack up the mines after the war was declared over, they did notice that four mines were still out there in the bay. To this day, we've only found one of those four. So there's still three somewhere out there floating around or anchored down to the seabed, buried with sand that we don't know about. Light. This is the furthest point of the island that you can drive to. Everything north of here is habitat protected, so you're not allowed to drive past this point. However, you can walk. During the war, this was the furthest point of the base as well. The only thing that they had north of here was a couple of uh, decoys that they set up on the beach in the hopes that the Japanese would spot that, fire at that, and give away that they're on their way. There's something down here on the beach. It might be a balloon. things 
wash up everywhere. All right, guys, so we're gonna take the Northern Access track over to Poverty Creek now. One of the main animals that you'll see up here at Bribie are your eastern grey kangaroos. They're up to about six foot tall when they're fully grown. In the wild they'll live up to around about 12 years, about 20 years in captivity. So we've got a nice healthy population here on the island and it's, uh, it's not rare to see quite a few of them while you're out and about as well. A couple of big ones there. We're going to leave these guys, we're going to keep going, we're going to go up to Poverty Creek, we're nearly there now. We're just on our way into the Poverty Creek area. Uh, the Poverty Creek area is a camping and day use area nowadays, but it used to be a cattle farm. Uh, from the mid 1800s up until 1988, when they brought the National Parks Act in, they actually moved the cattle farmers on. And it's, um, it's been national parks ever since. It's a really beautiful spot. You get lots of kangaroos, you get goannas. Uh, there's toilet facilities up here and, um, and fire pits to be able to have a fire if you camp out for the night. There is a day use fire pit as well at the day use area. And it's just a lovely spot, nice and green, nice and lush, and a lot of animals around. 